Well, I've waited a little while to record an intro to this show. This is not a normal show, not a normal conversation. It affected me very deeply. I first heard about this program at a dinner with some YPO members from around the world uh, up in the California wine country. People then around me, I started to hear conversations about a program where CEOs, entrepreneurs, and investors went to work with prisoners in uh, maximum security prisons, and they were deeply moved and affected by the experience. So I said, yes, I'm in. I'm into and interested in boundary pushing, deeply moving experiences, and I went. We recorded this show after the end of the first of two days of working with a group of incarcerated men uh, who who had felony convictions in a maximum security prison in the high desert of Susanville, California. Uh, This has uh, given me a great deep a deal of insight and reflection on my relationship to human beings and what they're capable of and how they can surprise us. Since one of the hardest things that we all have to do and deal with is deal with human beings, I think this show is well worth a listen. You'll hear power and passion because I'm right in the middle of two days of a very intense experience here with the creators uh, and and the folk the the woman who created the program and uh, and one of the executives in charge of of leading it and running it. Uh, it's now grown. It has surprising results. Listen in for this incredibly uh, powerful and reflective show. Hello and welcome again to the Scaling Up Business Podcast. I'm your host and scaling coach, Bill Gallagher. So this is a kind of an unusual show. Uh, on the show with me today will be a couple people. We're going to start off with Tom Williams. Tom and I are up in Susanville, California, near the High Desert Correctional Facility, the California State Prison. State Prison. And we've just spent the day, a remarkable day, with a group of entrepreneurs, coaches, CEOs, investors, working with like serious uh, inmates um, in the prison there on developing them in a really extraordinary program. Uh, it goes by Hustle 2.0 today. And so that's what we're talking about. Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Tom is, uh, he's the chair of the Pelican Bay Volunteer Alliance and uh, is his sort of money-making gig. He's an investor uh, in tech, media, and healthcare companies around the world. He got involved in the Defy program as the uh, or predecessor Predecess, to yeah. this was known. Uh, and Tom's been here with a group of us today. I don't know how many people we had. I'd, uh, say, I'd say about 40, 40 or 50. Yeah. And the, so we found out about it through a group, of, an alumni group around the EO Birthing of Giants program that's today called the Gathering of Titans, where Kat Hoke came and spoke. And we should have Kat joining us in a few minutes. Um, and uh, so that's and my wife called me and said, oh, we're going to go to this thing. It's going to be awesome. You're going to love it. And I am like, oh, we're going to go to prison. We're going to coach, mentor and, and work with these inmates all day. Uh, and I wasn't so scared about that, but I was really anxious about one all the rules and the idea of just being inside any locked serious environment like that who are mm-hmm. the people i figured we'd be with good people like people who there was hope for people uh and i i was just overwhelmed by the humanity mm-hmm. of the things i mean people told me they did ama- like horrific things like mm-hmm. that they'd committed crimes in their past that were just but when I looked into their eyes and when I talked to them, I saw such like goodness and warmth and hunger and humility and, and these people and and they spoke honestly about the things with with regret with um, I mean it was real it was but real and raw. I can imagine that your listeners right now are thinking you know they must be high on some California supply <laughs> right now. Did you did you notice how? in the exercise of step to the line or in the life maps that you heard. I mean, part of this program really helps volunteers understand that the men here that while they have these labels for the crimes that they committed, as you understand their stories, how they were raised, they're raised in poverty, they're raised from families who, you know, you can understand that while each person that, you know, that we met today took responsibility and accountability for the crimes that they committed, I think the, 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 the real thing here is, is that these men are not their crimes. 
and no, that the crime is something they did. Correct. And that the more that you understand where they're coming from, it's easier. It's not to say that everybody will have compassion, but it's easier to find compassion when you understand that most people grew up in extreme poverty. They grew up in gang infested neighborhoods. They grew up hearing gunshots. They grew up seeing their family members killed in some cases. They grew up um, themselves victims, survivors of abuse, not yeah. just physical, but sexual. Yeah. And so a lot of these young men, you know, took to the streets because their own families could not protect them. They could not right. provide for them. So where what happens is they meet these men on the streets who are involved with gangs and they say, we're here for you. You know, it's in the same way, you know, and, and you know, look at me, I've got money, I've got power, I've got respect. These are all the things that all of us as humans want, right? Um, and And so what they're taught because they don't know any better is, this is the way, you know, if you follow my path, you will succeed. Meanwhile, these, these gang leaders don't care about their supposed family. They care about, they their see them as pawns, there. exactly. Right. Right. And so I think what ends up happening is by the time that we, um, that the men arrive at our, you know, at our programs, they've already done, as you've heard today, sometimes decades, but yeah. several years of hard time. So the first guy I talked to today started talking about the first abuse he experienced was before he could really consciously, it was, he was like a year and a half old. Mm -hmm. That's when it began. And, uh, and he had a steady stream of horrific events that happened to him in his family, home and, and community environment right from the beginning. Babysitters, parents, um, violence in the neighborhood, family members, siblings, like just unbelievable things one after another after another. And then as a, as a middle schooler and a teenager, he starts to get involved in, in some of the stuff. It just was what he grew up and he learned. Right. And, uh, and, and, and then uh, he committed some crimes. I forget. I talked to so many people today. I forget what his particular thing was. Um, uh, but he's like, I did some terrible things mm -hmm. and I've been paying and he'd been in for more than a decade and he had more time to go and stuff. But I'm talking to someone who's thoughtful and caring yeah. and, you know, like I'm like this, this human being is his life's not over. Correct. This is like a, an opening chapter to, but he has the opportunity to write the rest of his life story. Yes, absolutely. And I think that you know, because um, the state Thinking, of Thinking, feeling, caring, you know, yeah. soulful. Like, yeah. And, and regretful of his things, but also, like, I just was, like, overwhelmed. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, um, because the state of California has imposed such hard time, yeah. um, you know, you met many men who have been sentenced to 20 years plus who didn't actually commit murder. So, you know... Um, the unfairness of a lot of how sentencing has worked in this state and this country um, has put people in for a long time. And then what we're not exposed to here is in order to survive in prison, mm -hmm. you know, there is not, I mean, I believe we all have choice, but when the way that, you know, prison gangs work, um, you know, to choose to not obey an order can get you killed. Right. Fight, survive. Absolutely. Yeah. So you commit subsequent crimes. Correct. In prison, then you do more time, then you endure solitary. Yeah, and, and I think it's important for um, your listeners to understand the evolution of corrections in this state, because the the R rehabilitation was only added ten years ago. Yeah. So it used to be that the state said, you know, lock them up, throw away the key until the sentence is over. Right. And then they started realizing that that wasn't working and that, you know, there was overcrowding and and it just wasn't doing anything. And and so they added the R. Um, and so what ends up happening in each, uh, you know, for us is programming. When they complete a program that's recognized by CDCR, that gives them positive points. If they were to, to commit an offense, um, that adds points. Yeah. So we're on a level four yard, which is the highest level of security, which means that you've, you've created more points for yourself. Yeah. Right. But at Pelican Bay, 
we work from level four yards like this all the way down to level two. And what's mm. incredible is men who were on the most intense level four yards of Pelican Bay have stepped themselves down all the way to level two. So this programming and programming like it, for the men that really are investing in themselves, they're hungry for programs like this because it allows them the opportunity to get out of violent environments. Once you're in less secure environments, the incidences of violent violence are so much lower because yeah. everybody's worked so hard to get there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, so I was a little surprised as we began the program today that there were a number of people with very, very long sentences, mm -hmm. were very uh, life without possibility of parole type sentences, and not a lot of them, but a few of them. Mm -hmm. And and then I came to understand over the course of the day that those some of those people are, are old timers, they're elders, they're leaders, and they create an example. They spread good words. So yes. getting some of those people involved in a program that that develops and reminds them of their humanity uh, has positive ripple effect to the whole population. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the longer that you've survived in prison, especially, you know, a maximum or a super max, the more credibility that you earn amongst your, you know, the, 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 the people in your yard. And what's been incredible is a number of the people that have kind of put their hands up early in our programs are people that have done, you know, a long time. They've, they've earned, you know, a lot of respect for surviving and, and so on. And they have, you know, if they can show up with yeah. life sentences, yeah. then the youngster who, who actually can get out in two years, um, why would he not, why would he not, you know, give it a shot? Right. right. Well, about how many people were in the program today? Between our volunteers and, uh, you know, and Mavericks. As no, the, the Mavericks. Yeah. The Mavericks, there were, uh, well, if there were four, it was two to one, it was a perfect two to one right. ratio. So I think, you know, close to a hundred, you know, close to a hundred of those, it's, because if we have 40 to 50 volunteers, double that. Right. So we had 80 to a hundred maverick participants in there. Correct. And then we had the balance of us. And, and sometimes we have another class tomorrow yes. that we're doing. And I think we're going to get a few more people that were flight delayed that will Correct. get in here today. So we traveled in. I mean, the volunteers came from the All East over. Coast, from other kind from Canada, from across the U.S. and mm -hmm. so on to be there because it's such a powerful and engaging program. Uh, and it's been getting a lot of attention around uh, with these folks developing because of its um, uh, because of its effectiveness, right? Yes. Tell me about how you got involved in the program and how you learned about it, and 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 then and maybe you can weave in some of the, the sure. Stats, right. So um, I was at an event that um, was talking about how to, you know, rebuild cities in America, mm. and it was uh, kind of a set of constituents that included, you know, elected officials, policy people, entrepreneurs, nonprofits, and so on. It's a very interesting mix of people, highly curated event. Mm. And, you know, you've been to a million of these as I have, and you're at the dinner that night and the rubber chicken dinner, as I like to call it. And you're at one of the round tables and I'm listening to the woman next to me tell a very en engrossing story. But then the MC says, well, we're acknowledging, you know, a few different organizations tonight for their great work. And Unilever was, was, you know, recognized. And, and then here's a nonprofit recognition and it was for uh, Defy. And, um, what I heard was the, the first thing that struck me was America's recidivism rate. Yeah. Once you have a criminal record, once you spent 70%, time jail, or it's over 70%. Yeah. And so, you know, you're just aghast at that number. And I think we all, whether we know the exact number or not, we're aware of the fact that mass incarceration is a big problem in this country. And um, so, but what to do about it? You know, it seems such an intractable problem. And what I was introduced when I, when I heard the, the program being introduced, I heard that, you know, Defy had this incredibly low uh, recidivism rate of the 2000 men and women that had received programming during their time. And what she told the story was, is most of the guys that end up in prison were, had entrepreneurial instincts. They, they, yeah. they knew the hustle. They, they were willing to work for themselves and take responsibility. They were just selling the wrong product. They were selling an illegal product, right? <laughs> All the right skills, the wrong product. And so the 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 thing that really got me was what if we could transform that hustle yeah and um and she talked about you know this entrepreneur coaching and 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 she provided some concrete case studies yeah 
So I went up to her and I said, look, I don't know you, you don't know me, but I need to work for you. You know, yeah. what can I do? And she yeah. said, well, before anything, come and witness, you know, who these men are and what our work is. Right. And she invited me to what ended up being our first trip to Pelican Bay yeah. um, in April of 2017. Yeah. And quite like you showing up here, I had really no idea what to expect. And, um, you know, even going through, uh, you know, the the process that we went through today to get into where we work is is a real mind bending activity because yeah. you know you're just awestruck by kind of the intensity of the place and you know um, but then you're well you, there's triple wire and sensing there's and gunners guard and, towers and, yeah. and gunners and electric fence yeah and, I mean it's serious and you yeah. go through layers of stuff this is a level four facility right Correct, we're yes. in yeah. Yeah, and, and, and so, and then the, the Pelican Bay staff, uh, the facility there um, where we started working was the Supermax. So that's actually, you know, the highest of security for level four yards. Mm -hmm. And so um, the day that I went in there, I was quite immediately taken by several men that I had met. And as an investor and, you know, investing at the earliest stages and latest stages, you know, I'm having to make split second, sometimes not split second, but, you know, decisions on very, very little information yeah. um, that are highly consequential if I'm wrong. And so those same instincts to pick people um, allowed me to, you know, kind of pick the right people. And, yeah. and, and I, these men that I met, you know, in April, I've had the great honor and privilege to see how programs like this take hold of not everybody. It's not like we're waving a magic wand and, and, and everybody suddenly transformed. No. We're offering them gifts, which if they are prepared, ready, and willing, and able to take those Pull gifts, yeah. and, 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 and really, uh, that's exactly the right word. I, I, I describe it as climbing a ladder, you know, yeah. one rung at a time. And I've seen, I mean, first of all, we've seen not only men from the Pelican Bay Supermax parole, but we've seen almost every one of them either not only just employed, but gainfully employed, um, appreciatively. I think that's the word I would use is appreciatively employed. Mm. And by that, I mean that their employers are saying these men are our model employees. Mm. And then we have a few men who have actually legitimately started their own businesses and are either self-sufficient or very close to self-sufficient from their own business income, which is incredible to see. Well, the, yeah. So I heard businesses today that were, uh, they wanted to start a food truck. They wanted to create a barber shop. They wanted to create a, a mobile hair extensions business. And then I heard people who just wanted to become a chef, who wanted jobs and that kind of thing, and who were still thinking about what might be entrepreneurial in nature, but as a whole range of things like that. And, and the most remarkable thing happened on our way in. Um, I was coaching one of my teams. So folks on the listener, you don't know, but folks in, in our world know that I'm a scaling coach and I coach a, a range of teams. And one of my teams, that's uh, that's been around has had this amazing new leader join the team. And this is a guy who was a former inmate in the California system and who uh, was guilty and convicted and served time for serious drug crimes and went through a different program. But the, this team was like blown away by the difference he'd made impacting their team, leveling up. Uh, uh, rank and file members on their team that they have a high turnover business and one of my clients uh, is the nature, seasonal nature of their business. And this guy had come in and he had this intense background. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to this program tomorrow. And he's like, oh, it's really great. We have to connect. Let's, let's get back together. And um, I, anyway, I'm, I'm struck by that for the last two years, recruiting people has uh, been an extraordinary challenge for companies across the country. But in any time, people is the hardest part of the equation. That's right. <laughs> people are powerful, enigmatic, irrational, like, right, everything. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's something to master about people, which is what I thought this was so relevant to have in a business. Why is it that all these entrepreneurs want to come out here and do this? 
because we're reminded of what makes people extraordinary because we're reminded of our own humanity because we're, you know, like it, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, we're joined now with Kat Hope, the founder of the program, The Origin. And so hey. uh, Sharon, hi <laughs> Kat. Hey. <laughs> Rare. Who's joining? We've been wrapping up. So this show is a little fresher and rawer than some. And mm -hmm. I just want to thank you so much for having us all be part. I, we were all deeply moved by the experience of the day. Thank you for coming to prison. <laughs> did you tell did you tell them about your your new move that you showcased? No. <laughs> There's a lot of dancing. Don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry, Bill. I will not snitch you out. Snitches so get stitches. So. I, uh, I'm famous for a lot of things. Yes. Picking great restaurants in towns I've never been. Yes. Uh, making huge rooms where people cry, mm -hmm. right? With coaching and speaking and things like that. Um, and increasingly for the dancing, right? Yeah. And I think that like movement and, and speaking out and all these things are really powerful and yet we're so inhibited by them. Uh, this is a little bit like with, I don't know where you're going to go with this, but talk to us about music and movement in the program. Well, where does that come from? Yeah, it clearly so works. Before, before the guys, the Mavericks are incarcerated men meet the volunteers. They're typically so terrified mm. of you guys yeah. of speaking to yeah. what they'll refer to as like normal people or yeah. outside citizens or whatever, because they've been locked up for so long and you guys as first time visitors are typically so terrified as well. Yeah. And so uh, we have a party. We it make it fun ice. too yeah. to break the ice. And we yeah. use, so we use movement and music and networking and all of these yeah. things to break down barriers. And then the other thing is that we are, we are very blessed to be able to recruit some of the country's top investors and most successful CEOs who sometimes take themselves very seriously. <laughs> and long. on the other side of that, we uh, also have the privilege of working with some of the most influential gang members and gang leaders who take themselves very seriously. And so we use goofiness as a tactic to so break down break barriers yeah. so that then we get, can get to the heart of the matter as quickly as possible. Well, it's, it's genius. And I think like when uh, I'm uh, known for helping companies create their purpose statement for their company really, really fast. And one of the things I do is I make them walk. So I sent, I give them an assignment. I send them off in Paris and the movement makes an, a huge difference. And I happened on it just by accident once, like, and I've started to see incorporating into different times, making people move in the afternoon. Sometimes we'll have people do stretching or yoga like things or whatever. And we have music on every break. And, and you did that way to like a whole other level. And it really did it. It like connected us. And uh, look, the, here's the thing that we're not saying. Also, the overwhelming uh, number of people that we dealt with, and I would bet overall, were African American and people of Hispanic origin. Yeah. People of color were in there. Uh, out of uh, 80 folks or whatever, two would be described as Caucasian in that program. Right. Today, and, that was definitely the case. And and yet, on the other side, the volunteers, the CEO, investor, coach folks were overwhelmingly Caucasian right? in some flavor, right? Yeah, it was interesting. Today, we had less white Mavericks than normal, and we had the most white volunteers <laughs> that we've ever had. It's quite it was it's even quite diverse. <laughs> it's a lot more diverse. So we, oh, we encourage a lot of a lot of diversity, but I think um, we I was grateful to get to recruit from the GOT group and mm -hmm. three groups. I, I did speaking engagements to three EO graduate groups in Boston. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would say that those groups that are recruited from were quite white themselves. And yeah. so, it, you know what, though, it it just worked out that way. Yeah. And it's fine. And, yeah. and we want people to come and we don't discriminate on skin no, color no, either no, way no. and everyone has something great to offer so. well the thing that i was struck by especially as we did the line exercise where we step forward and back depending on the different life experiences and circumstances you realize there are definitely things that separate us and, and there are a lot of things though that are the same and as people step there were a lot of like childhood early adult kinds of things that i'm like oh i had that happen i did that but i didn't get put in jail for that Right. When I had that happen, a cop told me drive safely and go home, um, and you know things like that. Uh, right. Well, everyone in that room 
pretty much everyone in that room is a maverick. Um, we are all, whether we are wearing blue, incarcerated mm-hmm. or not, mm-hmm. pretty much everyone in that room has been driven to extremes in their lives. And most people in that room were driven to extremes by some kind of pain. And yeah. so deep um, shared pain brings us all together. But it, choosing to become an entrepreneur and investor is, is a freak route. And we don't realize that sometimes when we only hang out in these circles, right? But it'd be much easier to have an average job or career mm-hmm. and to not choose a career where you really put yourselves out there. Similarly, our Mavericks chose very dangerous, extreme lifestyles as well. Mm-hmm. Some of them, it just seemed like they just, I mean, actually most of the ones I talked to there, you could call it a choice, but it was not very conscious. It was just the world they lived in. As my kids know room service, like the back of their hand, these, these kids, it's just like, oh, what happened? Like my sibling got shot and my dad went to jail and I like, it's just, it was the family business. Oh, that's exactly right. And just as for me, like taking my SATs and going to college was a duh thing. Of course I was going to do that. That's all I was raised to do. So these guys saw prison was a rite of passage. Um, Prison was actually something that they didn't fear. Uh, Tougher sentencing doesn't Doesn't make a difference. No, it's, it's, you go part going to prison is what almost every adult male in their communities is what they see doing. And that's why now the path that they're taking is so countercultural to what they were raised in the environments. And it's part of why I have so much respect for them is because they have the courage to break legacies and to change things. And they want new patterns for their children and for their families. And even from behind bars, their voices are incredibly powerful. But when these men and the women that we serve, when they get released back into society, the impact that they have and Tom here brought one of our guys from Pelican Bay back into prison just a a year after his release, who's now running a business. And when they come back and speak about the impact that they're having on their communities, on their families, on their children, it's so inspiring to see them changing these patterns. It's like the ops guy at one of my leadership teams who's just just really leveling up all of their teams because he's got he's he's been to places and through things that people aren't. And he He not only is really rigorous and demanding of his team, but he also looks into their soul way more than than everybody. One of the guys that I talked to today is like, he's like, I did so many terrible things. It just became normal to me. It just stopped even being bad. Like I just it just he said. And I think now I can see the faces. I can think about the things and I I can't ever make that right. He said, but I've spent my entire adult life in here. And I like, hey, I'll never get back those what are supposed to be the best years of my life. He said, but I but I I want to get out and I never want to see a place like this again. And I want to to make a better ending, right? Like to right. do something cool. I was just so like, oh my God, what can we it do is, to help you? <laughs> it is healthy that that our men have remorse yeah. over their poor yeah. decisions. Yeah. But we say this to them and it's true for us too. Not one of us can change our past. The past yeah. is the past. The men that we serve in hustle 2.0 have made very bad decisions. Every one of them in that room has committed violent crime. They are not proud of those decisions, but as we saw today, every one of them is redeemable. They take ownership of their past. They're accountable. They want a better future. We as Americans say, that this is a justice system where they serve their time. So who do we want coming back to society? 95% of them get released back to society. So, so they're, they're coming they're, back. They're learning to write resumes. They're learning to make business pitches. They're learning to create business ideas. I mean, they we saw just a little piece of they're it, They're right? getting a whole bunch of character development. They're getting reentry planning. They're getting family planning, relational skills, how to communicate, parenting skills, etiquette. They're learning about how to create social, positive social impact. They're learning to have impact in prison while they're there and then build and restore bonds with their families when they get out. So you've launched three of these programs that are continuing. This is the third of the, is that right? This is the third organization. that The third organization that's doing this. And overall, our our stats are above 75% recidivism. Is that right in the country? In in America, 
uh, 77% of people are rearrested and go back behind bars within five years of release. The last program that I started called Defy Ventures has a proven, validated, verified recidivism rate of less than 5%, a three-year 77 to less than five, yeah, three working, years. Yeah, working with people who committed violent crime. We do not cherry pick. We have a yeah. 100% acceptance rate. Defy does too. Yeah. Um, so we take anyone who applies. Yeah. And when we go to a new prison... We tell the warden, put us on your worst yard with the most violence, because that's where we think we can make the greatest impact. And what is it that you, I, you I want to say? Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, the real thing that's being given to through this program is love. Yeah. And a belief in in self, yeah. which comes through volunteers. Yeah. And that's why when you... You know, everybody's uncomfortable bragging. I think successful people don't like talking about their successes for the most part. But this is where bragging is important because here's somebody that's sitting here who in many cases has had his family completely abandon him because he, you know, broke the last straw of many, many straws. And so he's sitting there thinking, I'm irredeemable. I'm not worthy of any of this. And in comes all these volunteers from all over the place with all the success and what they're thinking is, why? Why yeah. would these people? But all they then take away is they believe in me. Yeah. And and those that that continue to show up and as the program unfolds, you're just, you know, here on the first day right, right over the year course of, of a year long program. Yeah. And that gets reinforced to them. Yeah. And so suddenly that notion that I can change you know, I can't change my past, but I can change my future. Right. And to the volunteers that show up, if I ever think about screwing up because I think I'm not worthy, I can't do it because those volunteers have invested so much. That's yeah. the volunteer yeah. experience. Yeah. And what I want to add to what Tom just said is that um, I have been doing this work for 15 years. I've mm -hmm. now started programs that have graduated more than 6,000 incarcerated men, women, and youth. And I've brought the programs that have started have brought 7,000 volunteers mm. into prison from mm. across the mm. world. Mm. Before this, I did venture capital and private equity, and I appreciate a good ROI story yeah. and results. And what I would say is that the number one way to prevent and cure recidivism, people going back to prison, yeah. is if these people can have a positive legal vision for themselves. Yeah. And that starts with hope. Yeah. Because prison is a place where people learn to survive on next to no hope. Yeah. It's like they write themselves off after society writes them off. But when we come in there, like today, they yeah. start to have the hope that it is possible and that they do matter. Well, and when a man believes that about himself, then his actions get in line yeah. and his planning gets yeah. in line. Yeah. And then they can gain the skills right. if they're afforded the opportunity at rehabilitation. And then everybody wins. So their resumes, the kinds of jobs they want, they're, they all seem plausible and reasonable. I did see that this is not a stretch to think about that. We certainly have to interrupt the choices. They need some new training. They need to be careful about their environment. There's a whole world of stuff like that. Here's the thing I want to... Um, tell our folks, I don't care about your politics. You could be a bleeding heart liberal. You could be law and order, hardcore, conservative, whatever it is. If you're an entrepreneur, a business leader who, which is the vast majority of our audience, and you've got to develop people and recruit people and understand people, I strongly invite you, encourage you to go do one of the volunteer days here you go do this thing, you'll level up your people chops. You'll get an appreciation for humanity and connecting with people and communicating. And this notion of I'm only good with certain kinds of people and I can't relate to other kinds of people, you'll disappear that in a day. Mm -hmm. that, that's say. sometimes a little bit more of an excuse. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, like, just oh, saying, I'm good with yeah, this kind, I'm yeah. not good with that kind. But yeah. like, if you Learn, have that going on, grow, and I think a lot of us do, you know? spend yeah. a day. Yeah. Come to one of your things, yeah. and, and I'll give you the web address in just a minute, um, and and you'll be altered. Whether you want to do it again and again forever or, or contribute to the program or Come for knows. a drive-by. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, Catherine Hoke, 
Tom Williams, the program is Hustle 2.0. And you're going to find it at Hustle 20. Hustle 20.com. Yes. You go find all about it. I just, I encourage everyone to, to find a date, pick a date, go do it. The, the folks here are CEOs, investors, coaches, like serious, hard, yeah. hardcore, credible people in the world that we tend to look up to come out of here and every single person today was deeply moved and altered by the things that we did and saw. Yeah. And, and, really and if you want to just shoot an email to volunteer at hustle20.com, then we'll oh, shoot great. back okay. when we, we set Volunteer at hustle20.com. Okay. Yeah. We'll put all that stuff in the show notes. Uh, Catherine, Hoke, you can also read the book, A Second Chance for you, for me, and for the rest of us. Uh, it's been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks all right. for coming. Reminder to all of our listeners, we're back here every week with a new show on something to do with scaling up, getting your people, strategy, execution, cash decisions right. You'll find all the back catalog of shows and everything at scalingcoach.com. Scalingcoach.com. Thanks again for listening. We'll talk to everybody next week. Bye-bye. Well, a big thanks to the creator of this whole mess, the world of scaling up and the Rockefeller habits, Vern Harnish. This show was produced by Lucy Summers. The audio production is done at Podfly Productions and edited by Albert Burge. The show notes are compiled by Ann Kudina and proofread by Tim McGowan. If you got value out of the show, please, please share it and pass it along to somebody else right now. Then go ahead and like and subscribe. Uh, give us a review wherever you get your podcast, whether it be iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever. We could use your review uh, to build our following. Uh, you can also let us know what parts you loved and if you'd like to participate in any way or have a suggestion for us. Info at scalingcoach.com is the email for all your feedback. Thanks again for listening and keep scaling up.